God's word for our meditation today comes from our gospel reading. And as we continue to look at our Savior's sermon today, it's important that we remember the context of last week so that some of this at least makes sense in the context of why Jesus would say it. Last week, as you remember, we talked about how Jesus wants us to be salt and to be light in this world. That is how God made us to be, to live holy lives for him. And Jesus ended that section of his sermon by talking about how our righteousness before God needs to be perfect. That's what God expects of us. Our righteousness needs to be even better than the righteousness of the Pharisees, Jesus says, who from an outward perspective were some of the most righteous people in the world. And this whole section from Jesus' sermon today is very hard-hitting law because Jesus wants us to all understand how we can easily become pharisaical when it comes to our obedience of the law, when it comes to our own sin. Because the Pharisees focused all of their attention on obeying the laws at face value. And I think sometimes we can be guilty of that too. So Jesus today takes some of the commandments and shows how easily we break them, even if from face value it doesn't look like we do. Jesus begins with the fifth commandment. You have heard that it was said, you shall not murder. As kids, we hear this commandment in Sunday school, we hear it in catechism class, and right away we think, well, I haven't committed that sin, I haven't murdered anybody. And that's the Pharisaical mindset in action. We think that just because we don't actually commit the act of murder, then we are righteous regarding this commandment. But Jesus then points out how many times we actually do break this commandment. He says, but I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister is subject to judgment. Have you ever been angry before? I think we all have been angry at one point or another. Maybe, maybe you're driving and someone cuts you off and you slam on your brakes, almost hitting them. Are you angry in that moment? Maybe you don't say raka or call them a fool like someone would in Jesus' day, but what's the modern day equivalent of that? You call them stupid? Maybe you call them an idiot or, or a dumb fill in the blank or any other bad word you can think of in that moment? Sure, you didn't take their life from them, but how does your heart feel toward them? Do you think that the world would be a better place if they weren't in it in that moment? Or maybe this hits closer to home. Maybe you're at your wit's end with your spouse and you're stressed up to here, and maybe they're just not treating you the way that they used to when you get mad at them, and maybe you don't even want to talk about it. Or, or maybe you haven't talked to your sibling in months because he or she wasn't there when mom or dad was dying. Or maybe you're angry with a, a fellow Christian who wronged you and, and maybe they don't even know the extent of how deeply and severely they hurt you, but nonetheless you just hold this anger in your heart toward them. Or, or maybe you watch the news and you see all the horrible things that happen and you judge and you get angry at complete strangers who don't even know who you are. Yeah, maybe we don't commit murder, but Jesus says all of those things are just as deserving of the fires of hell than actually ending someone's time of grace. Because that, that danger of having that hatred and anger in our hearts is after a while we become callous to it. And it doesn't feel wrong or sinful anymore. The only thing that would be wrong is if I killed the person I'm mad with. And if we come before God and we confess our sins and we receive absolution, and then we go home and pick up the fight right where we left off, were we really all that sorry in the first place? Jesus first tells us to go to that person who we have some beef with, and with a heart of humility and love, not looking to be right or to make a point, but for the sake of both of your souls, show that forgiveness and love to each other. 
then we can approach God at his altar with a pure heart, with a clean conscience, and know that all is right before him. Jesus continues with the sixth commandment. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. Again, the pharisaical thought is that if I don't sleep with someone else other than my spouse, then I have not committed adultery. Therefore, I am righteous regarding this commandment. Jesus says, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Maybe you've heard it said that it's okay if I look as long as I don't touch. Or maybe it's natural for me to have those feelings and to have those emotions, but as long as I don't act on them, then I'm fine. And people like to justify lusting after somebody else and how easy it is for all of us to do it and not even think it's that bad or it's just an innocent thought. What can I do? And today, we don't need magazines anymore to show us the, the hottest men or women on the planet in as little clothing as possible. We have the internet where we can look up whatever our hearts desire and fulfill those desires whenever we need to. But it's only looking, so it's okay. Or I'm not married, so I'm not committing adultery, so it's okay. And maybe it's not even over the internet, but, but maybe there's that coworker or that friend who just gets me and makes me laugh and makes me happier than I've ever felt for a long time with my spouse. It's okay if I confide in them and show them that really close relationship as long as it doesn't get physical. But then soon that thought starts to creep in the mind that says, well, I can always just get divorced because he isn't making me happy. He isn't fulfilling me like he used to, maybe like this other person is. Jesus says, if you're looking and you shouldn't, gouge your eye out. If your hand causes you to open that internet app on your phone when you shouldn't, cut it off. And he's serious about it too. Jesus would rather have you in heaven missing a hand than be in hell suffering for eternity as a whole person. If we have a cancerous tumor in our bodies, we cut it out, at least we try to, so that it doesn't destroy the rest of our body. Same thing goes if a body part, Jesus says, causes you to sin. But we know that with the hands and with the eyes isn't where this all starts. Right? It starts in the heart, it starts in the mind. And I don't think it's possible to cut out that part of the brain or to rip our heart out. Instead, we need to cleanse our hearts. We need to come before God. We need to confess those sins and ask him to heal us daily, to remind us of our baptisms, that we have been set apart for sanctification, as Paul says. We have been washed clean so that we can live a righteous life for the works of Jesus. We cannot fight sin and temptation on our own. We need the righteousness of our Savior Jesus for us. Jesus concludes by saying, Again, you have heard that it was said, Do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. I don't take oaths, so I'm righteous here too, says our sinful nature proudly. In Jesus' day, the people knew that taking an oath on the Lord's name was wrong. So as Jesus said, they would do things to find that loophole. They would swear on Jerusalem. They would swear on something else in order to find that loophole that they weren't swearing on God's name. But nonetheless, it was wrong. We see Simon Peter do this when he was in the temple courtyard during Holy Week and he was being interrogated by those people who said, you're a follower of Jesus. It's easy for us to do. Because when someone confronts us wanting to know the truth, in order for us to look truthful and serious or to cover up a lie, we might say, I swear to God. Or I swear on my mother's grave or I swear on fill in the blank with whatever we think is nice in the moment. But Jesus' point is to, to swear on something true 
is unnecessary because it's already true. And to swear on something false is just doubling down on the lie and the sin. Now, if you've ever been to jury duty or in the military or anything that requires you to take an oath by law, you can do that with a clear conscience. That's not what Jesus is talking about here. But Jesus warns us about making promises and taking oaths that we can never keep. Jesus says we can't even swear on ourselves because we are not perfect. We will eventually not keep that promise. Because we know what promises are. We know that God keeps his promises 100% of the time, every time, because that's what a promise is. It is guaranteed to be kept. And if we cannot promise a 100% guarantee, then Jesus says, just use yes or no. Be truthful with people. Don't use an unnecessary promise that you certainly won't be able to keep. Especially if that promise is on God, who always keeps his promises. After this reality check from Jesus, does your heart ache just as much as mine does? And this is only a couple of the commandments. Jesus could have gone on and on. Every commandment told us how we do not keep them like we might think we do. And Jesus doesn't sugarcoat things to make us feel better or to justify our actions. Instead, he speaks the difficult truth to our hearts because he wants us in heaven with him. He wants us to get rid of that sinful attitude that says, I'm righteous and instead look to him and say, you were righteous for me. If we rely on our obedience of the law for righteousness, then we will lose that game every single time. There are so many ways that we break the commandments, but thanks be to God that the law is not the last word that he speaks to us. Because we see here that Jesus is being salty. Have you noticed that? He talks about us being salty, but he's doing the exact same thing. He is preserving us with the law by reminding us of our desperate need of a Savior from sin. And then he seasons us with the gospel by reminding us that he kept all of the laws perfect in his obedience for the sake of you and me. So that his righteousness was given to us through our baptisms. So for all the times that we think we kept the law, Jesus says those times are forgiven. For all the times that we know that we were guilty of breaking the law, Jesus says those times are forgiven. Jesus was perfectly righteous for us and because he never sinned, period. We cannot be righteous in ourselves, but Jesus gives us his righteousness for free to all who believe. Thanks be to God for this undeserved and amazing gift of grace and love.